Good morning everybody. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be looking at the Privilege Project by the European Union, I guess. It's one to do with cryptographic protocols about supporting privacy, anonymity and efficient decentralised consensus for distributed ledger technologies. So I just wanted to thank Crypto Capital Venture for turning me on to this. I did see it mentioned in one of his videos recently, so I thought I'd check it out. And it was actually some really interesting stuff. Um, what it is on this website, it's basically a collection of their publications, events, news, stuff like that. Uh, on that website, I think there's about seven or eight papers. Uh, I've looked at the ones specifically to do with Cardano today. Um, so I've left a couple out. I can read about 70% of these, I'm not going to lie, about 30% of it is just jargon that is above and over my head. But, you know, I think if we can extract some of the central points out of this, then maybe we can get some value. So, what exactly is privilege? So, for those, that you, for those of you that cannot see the screen, let me just read 1.2 on D5.3's Exploitation Strategy and Roadmap. So, this is Privilege Value Proposition. Blockchain and distributed ledger technologies have emerged as one of the most revolutionary developments in recent years. With the goal of eliminating centralised intermediaries and installing distributed trusted services. They facilitate trustworthy trades and exchanges over the internet, power cryptocurrencies, ensure transparency for documents and much more. Although based on cryptographic techniques at their core, the currently deployed DLTs do not address privacy. Indeed, the very idea of a public ledger that stores a verifiable record of transactions at first appears inherently incompatible with the privacy requirements of many potential applications, which handle sensitive data such as trade secrets and personal information. New cryptographic techniques and protocols are therefore needed to protect the data, facilitate these applications and make DLTs deliver on their promises. Privilege realises cryptographic protocols supporting privacy, anonymity and efficient decentralised consensus for DLTs. In Privilege, several European key players in cryptographic research and from the fintech blockchain domains unite to push the limits of cryptographic protocols for privacy and security. Privilege encompasses research and design of cryptographic protocols as well as their implementation in toolkits that will be published by the project and made publicly available. The usefulness of these toolkits will be demonstrated through four ledger-based solutions. One, verifiable online voting. Two, contract validation and execution for insurance. Three, university diploma record ledger. And four, an update mechanism for stake-based ledgers. This document also has their strategy for exploitation and with regards to specific partners they're working with, IBM, universities, people like that. So, moving to the next document, D1.1 Requirements and Interface Design. Something that I thought was notably interesting was the ledger requirements. Um, it mentions stuff like consensus throughput, consensus latency, stuff like that. But really, the parts that I thought were interesting were the scalability, confidentiality uh, and identity services. Now, the reason that I thought this is very interesting is because this document was produced in... Something like yeah, uh, December 2018. So now this is like, what, like two and a bit years ago. But when we think about all the things that we've seen sort of coming about in the recent past, we see Cardano focusing on scalability with respect to Hydra. We see Atala Prism being used for identity services and the confidentiality and privacy aspect that we spoke about previously. It's also nice to know that as and when it's needed and with research from universities with help from the EU, eventually there may be toolkits for post-quantum secure protocols for these distributed ledgers. This is one of the things that I think is very interesting and quite funny. Um, and I've heard that Elon agrees with Vitalik on this. If you've seen Lex Friedman's recent interview with Vitalik, you may have seen uh, the part where he's talking about Cardano. And to be fair to Vitalik, compared to what he normally sort of says about Cardano, he was quite positive. He said that Cardano had some good ideas, but what he did criticise is the long academic approach. And 
essentially that he did not see the value in the academic rigour that is taking place. And with that being said, there's been hacks on Ethereum, Ethereum's integrity of the network has come into question after the DAO hack. Um, arguably, if they had built it outright with research in the first place, they would have built a system whereby that sort of attack cannot happen. As Charles is always saying, the structure and stability of Cardano is probably the most important aspect, especially if enterprise governments are going to be building on this. They need to know that the data is secure, the identity is secure, and that things are going to work as they should be working. No one's going to lose money or value. So the EU knows that it wants its blockchain technology to be transparent and auditable, and Cardano is built with this in mind. The requirement states that anybody should be able to answer when, why and how the system has evolved the way it has. The evolution history of the system should be open to everyone and form a globally consistent tamper evident public release log. The first thing that we need to validate in this case is that the update events are eventually stored on the blockchain. This will be the result of the integration of the update system to Cardano. This validation criterion is covered in blah 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 which checks that the update protocol is transparent. The second thing that we need to validate is auditability. To this end, we must ensure that all the reported outcomes from the update systems can eventually be computed from the data stored on the chain. This validation will be covered from criterion blah, 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 blah. Moving on to D3.1. This one mainly, if I'm going to be completely honest, is uh, quite a good introduction to just blockchain technology and protocols in general. It gives uh, varying summarised descriptions of different projects, or at least how the EU sees them. Uh, varying keys and summaries of terms in the industry. Uh, in general, it's quite a nifty little document. I've picked some things up, and um, some things I thought were better explained than I've seen anywhere else on the internet. So um, yeah, check it out if you ever want a short description of some of these projects or even just a dictionary of terms that you can look back on if there's ever something that you think, what the hell does that mean? So quickly, if we just have a look at the definition of Ripple. The Ripple blockchain, i.e. the XRP ledger that holds the corresponding cryptocurrency and its consensus protocol, introduced the idea of flexible trust assumptions, which goes beyond the typical BFT model, Byzantine fault tolerance, in the sense that each participating node declares a list of nodes that it subjectively trusts. In contrast, the trust sets of the standard BFT systems are global and must be the same for all nodes. The Ripple protocol itself is not based on research literature. An independent investigation showed that the original specification was flawed. A recent analysis by authors from Ripple reveals furthermore that it contains unnecessary steps and violates safety whenever the trust sets of nodes diverge. There are many claims in the blockchain industry that the Ripple protocol implements BFT consensus, but these works demonstrate that this view is wrong. So it's got these definitions for all sorts of projects, like I say, Ripple, Stellar, Anches. <laughs> no one calls it Anches. Uh, not anymore, anyway. Um, well, no one really speaks of Neo at all, but that is neither here nor there. Definition for proof-of-stake protocols, proof-of-stake blockchains, Ouroboros, Snow White, Algorand, Sleeper Consensus. See, um, you get the picture. Moving on. D4.1 covers, or at least with a gas, Cardano the requirements that the state-based ledger would have. These are mainly to do with the consensus model and voting and update proposals. The mechanisms for handling proposals, how many splits will be handled, actioned, how many agreed proposals will be actioned, and what a logical architecture for the update mechanism would look like. Now, the interesting thing for me is that this is written in... 2019. So if we can have a look at the Cardano roadmap, we can see that really what that's talking about there will be done in Voltaire. So we are currently awaiting the release of Gogan smart contracts, which should be here before the end of the year. However, they did say that last year, um, but 
You know, it seems promising. Charles seems to release these things at the exact moment that the technical analysis would say that he should in order to pump the price. So, that is something that Charles has said that he does not do. Um, but coincidentally, it does seem to be the case that these announcements are perfectly timed. And Charles is also a mathematician. So, yeah. The key messages of this privilege project are as such. The high-level message, the privileged project aims to develop cryptographic protocols enabling privacy, autonomy, and efficient decentralization consensus for distributed ledgers and blockchains. And the support of messages, uh, the privilege improves cryptographic schemes, protecting security and privacy in applications such as encrypted data on the internet and online payment. Leveraging tools such as privacy preserving mechanisms and quantum safe cryptography while focusing on emerging distributed ledger technology. Privilege shows how to perform practical, secure and privacy protecting transactions by making use of distributed ledgers. Privilege features four heterogeneous real world use cases to show concrete examples of the validity and the developed technology. Privilege bridges the gap between theory and practice with the deployment of a cybersecurity infrastructure based on distributed ledgers. Privilege addresses the tension between the transparency provided by the emerging distributed ledger technologies and the strict requirements for data privacy. And bringing it all back to the point of the Privilege Project, the point of the Privilege Project is to provide security, privacy and innovation to Europe and the rest of the world. Now, arguably we can't say that Cardano's Ethiopia plan actually impacts Europe in any specific direct way. No, we can't. But what we can say is that the goal of privilege is to offer seminar, lectures, lab courses and the like with topics related to the project, let results of the project influence and or improve education and training. I can say without doubt that uh, lectures have been given. Obviously, Cardano has been working with universities for the past few years at the very least. I can tell you first-hand experience that the Shelley Summit last year had an absolutely overwhelming amount of information, so much so I did not really have a clue what was going on for probably about eight out of the ten that I saw or heard. Regardless of the fact that Ethiopia isn't in Europe, we can see that it won't be too long until we have some of our neighbours taking part in this too. If you don't think Africa is a significant first stepping stone, then I don't think you understand how this works. It's the sandbox. These countries, they have young population, population savvy with electronics, mobile phone, internet data, stuff like that. But what we don't have is any existing financial infrastructure. And therefore, believe it or not, it's actually far easier to implement than it would be in a Western country. If you're thinking about trying to implement this in the UK, we already have existing systems in place that sort of work reasonably well. I mean, if you're in the UK, you'll probably moan and be like, no, they're a bunch of crap. But being completely honest, we have access to certain services that provide us with value. Whether or not we get these as fast as what we want or with a high enough quality that what we want is a completely different question. We have access to these. It is available. We are privileged to do so. These countries don't even have access to the same services that we do, but we think are crap. So there is a massive amount of potential to be unlocked in these companies, a massive amount of GDP just waiting to be exploited. And not in a bad way. What I mean by that is we can give them the tools to improve their country, make it richer and improve the quality of lives for their citizens. And by we, I mean Cardano. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just wanted to give you guys an overview, really, of what documentation out there is already existing, how the EU is already looking at and working with Cardano for specific reasons that now, two or three years later, are actually coming to fruition. These things are being implemented real-world use case, right? And while people are crying about Elon Musk saying whatever the is said today, they're missing 
the important steps that are being taken. If you found value in this content, me doing content that most other YouTubers cannot be bothered to read through 200 pages of what is essentially, I'm not going to say bollocks, but just hard brain pain stuff, then please like the video and subscribe so that I can do more of this reading and you don't have to.